series that we've been carrying out. The series is entitled The Technology of Spiritual Promotion. And this morning I want to share with you a powerful message on the technology of opening doors. Amen. How many of you know that there are great things God has got in store for us? Amen. How many of you know that a lot of those things are behind closed doors? How many of you know that some of those things are behind locked doors? And how many of you know that if you want to gain access to those things, you have to know the technology of opening doors? Can I hear an amen? amen. And I promise you, after this message, you will you'll be thanking me by the door. You're saying, this is what I needed to hear. Right? Because the revelation around this will distinguish whether you have breakthrough through or not. You see many Christians pray for breakthrough. Many Christians ask God for breakthrough. Many Christians talk to other people and try and figure out how the world gets breakthrough. But I'm here to say to you this morning that when you look in the word of God, you see the keys to your breakthrough. And one of those key things, excuse the pun, is knowing how to open doors that are shut. Knowing how to open doors that are shut. You will want to make copies of this message and give it to your friends. People who aren't at church today, you will make copies of this message, I promise you. And you'll be dishing it out because you'll see that it's based on the word of God and it's key to your promotion. Can I hear an amen? amen. All right. So I'm going to preach fast. Listen fast. Don't let the enemy distract you in any way. Those of you who sometimes get clouded in your minds when you come to church, you know that happens. Where we can concentrate when we're watching 24, when we're watching Suits, or whatever your favorite TV series is, then the moment you come to church, you feel like falling asleep. The enemy wants to rob you of the seed that is about to be imparted right now. The technology of opening doors. The technology is basically the art of a practice. Everything has a technology to it. There's a technology to getting results in your prayer. If you just look through scripture, you'll see that there's certain things God resists. We spoke about keys to demotion last week. And I spoke to you about how to overcome demotion. Okay. Don't want to give negative titles to these things. But really, we're talking about keys to getting demoted. Okay. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles, if you have them. If you don't have them, sit next to a Christian. Turn with me, please, to Deuteronomy 15, verses 4 to 8. No, it's okay. Uh, we've also got stuff happening here on the screen. Deuteronomy 15, verses 4 to 8. I want you to know this morning that God wants you to succeed and prosper. And if you're a Christian and you're not too sure that God wants you to succeed and prosper, you're one of those who's, who's double-minded and stable in all his ways, as the book of James tells us, and you should not expect to receive anything. That's what the Bible says. That person should not re expect to receive anything. So my first point is that God wants you to succeed and prosper. You will not open doors that God wants you to open if you doubt that he wants you to open doors and go through them. Amen? So, let's just bed this down theologically. Deuteronomy 15 verses 4 to 8. However, there need be no poor people among you. Now, when the Bible says among you, it's talking about amongst your people. It's not saying, it doesn't say with you. It doesn't say in the land. And it's important to distinguish between those two. It's saying among you. So among you as believers, among you as my children, they need not be any poor. Now right now, who would categorize themselves as poor? Who here would categorize themselves as in lack? When you want to do stuff, you can't do it. One of the measures of prosperity is having everything you need in order to do what God wants you to do. So if I cannot have a ship 
that is going to go to Australia. Let's say I don't have the money for a ship that's going to go to Australia to supply Australia with oil. Does that mean I am poor? No, because that's not what God wants me to do. But if I say, God, what is your will for my life? What have you called me to? I need to have everything I need in order to do that. Amen? So if God wants us as a church to purchase land or to build a building, and if we don't have the money, it means we're living in lack. Amen? And that's why we need to understand that when you look in the book of Deuteronomy, it gives you a picture of God's heart for believers. When it talks about the blessing over the people of Israel, it's giving you a picture of God's portion for the people of God, the church. Are we, are we together? Because we're going to go deeper. So if not together at this stage, by, the, by halfway through, I would have lost you. Are we together? Amen. However, there need be no poor people among you. So can they be? Yes, but there doesn't need to be. And you see, when you're in a nation like this, it's important to hate poverty. Poverty in this nation is actually a moral problem. When you study the history of the nation, when you look at the work ethic of the people in this country, you will see that poverty has been a curse. It's not our portion. And people need to see the people of God prosper. Whenever we speak of prosperity in this church, we're talking about it at its multiple levels. Amen? Bible says, I pray that you may prosper as your soul prospers. So prosperity starts from the inside out. Biblical prosperity is the power to produce. Biblical prosperity is having in abundance everything I need in order to do what God has called me to do. Biblical prosperity is not just about money. Amen? Biblical prosperity is about favor. Biblical prosperity is about wisdom. When I need wisdom, do I have it? Yes. When I need a friend and company, do I have it? Yes. When I need a wife who loves me, do I have it? In abundance. Amen? Amen. Biblical prosperity means you're prospering as your soul prospers. It starts from the inside out. The Bible tells us that godly riches don't come with sorrow. So you can have a lot of cash in the bank, but if you're stressed out like some people have been, where they can't eat normal food because they've got so many ulcers in their tummy, that is not true prosperity. Can I hear an amen? Okay, let's keep going together. It goes on to say, For in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance he will do what all right so let's not let's not get into this thing of like no it's just talking about spiritual blessings let's not spiritualize things part of it is cash an aspect of it is cash don't tell me you're content to have your kids going to lousy schools because you can't afford the school you want to take your kids to and just say but it's just spiritual blessing I know yeah they're getting beaten up and bullied in that particular school but it's okay I must just be happy it's not your portion right I'm just wanting you to understand this principle that God wants you to succeed and prosper and if you're not you must problematize it if you're not you must have an issue about it that this is not God's portion for me one of the reasons people stay where they are is they haven't made an issue of it in fact they change their theology they begin to say I don't think it's for all of us I don't think I should be in abundance let me just say something else not everyone is called to be a millionaire let me just explain this the word provision in scripture what does provision mean to see the need beforehand provision for the vision So if you've got a vision to basically um, start a daycare center, right? If you're prospering in that, means you've got the cash to do that. Amen? But if your vision is to basically feed the world and you don't have the cash for that, guess what? You are in lack. Does that make sense? So your abundance, I'm talking now financially, is based on your need. Does that make sense? There's no point in saying, I've got a billion rand in my, in my bank account, but, but I've got no vision. 
Some of you are where you are at financially because you don't have a vision. Small vision, small provision. The provision is linked to the vision. Amen? Small vision, small provision. When you enlarge your capacity as an individual and say, God, I'm believing you for grace. God, this is what we want to do. God, this is what we want to do. Guess what? Something else begins to flow. Here's the key thing for the believer. It needs to be God's vision. It needs to be God's vision. And I'm jumping ahead of myself, but some of you have started businesses. But you have to learn, not all of you, some of you have to learn how to partner with God's kingdom. Because you see, God is building his church. And so I want to be associated and partner with that which God is building. God hasn't sat down and promised that I will build your businesses just so you can prosper for you and your family. That's my promise to you. God has said in his word, I am building my church. When business people, when entrepreneurs get the revelation that what God is interested in is his church and his kingdom, and they partner with that as his kingdom is extended, so goes their businesses. You you understand that? You see, true prosperity is this. God wants to finance his gospel. God wants to finance this kingdom takeover I spoke about at the start. That's what he wants to do. God wants to make his name great. God is not interested in your glory. He's interested in his glory. And when I learned that principle, I began to say to myself, I want to do the stuff that glorifies him. And when you link up with that, something kicks in. That's why the scriptures tell us very clearly that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then what will happen? All those things will be added to you. Problem with a lot of Christians who are bound by mammon are seeking all those things. Pastor, can you give me a strategy to get all those things? Pastor, can you give me ideas to get all those things? I want to read up in these books that I read how to get all those things. The Bible tells us, seek first the kingdom, the kingdom agenda. And then you get all those things added to you. Don't make those things your focus. If someone comes to me or to anyone else who's mature for financial counseling, the first question you must ask them is, is God first when it comes to your finances? Is God, is, have you got a kingdom agenda? There's no point in giving them all sorts of advice about all sorts of things if they're doing stuff that isn't building kingdom. You you understand what I'm saying? Now, there's some of you who are living your lives where it's like, us four and no more. If you've you've just got two kids. If you've got three kids, us five and no more. If you've got one child, us three and no more. If you haven't got kids, us two and no more. If you're single, me and myself and I, right? There's some people who live like that and they only experience a certain level of abundance. Hardly any abundance because they just live like that. Right? Then there are others who say, I've got a vision for something great in my life. And they start working out the technology to open doors to go to that next level. Can I, can I hear an amen? Okay, so let's proceed. He will richly bless you. If only you, will, you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I'm giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised and you will lend to many nations but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations but none will rule over you. So when you talk about abundance in terms of financial abundance, in terms of wealth, it's also linked to dominion and rulership. I'm going to show you that just now. It's linked to dominion and rulership. Amen? And that's a key in terms of unlocking certain doors. Verse verse 7. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land that the Lord is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. That's the principle of generosity. Right? New Testament example. Acts 
chapter 4 verses 32 to 37. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. That's the principle of stewardship right there and then. Where we don't have this mindset of this is my phone, mine, mine, oh I love my phone. Oh, my, my. The principle of stewardship is everything I have belongs to the Lord. And how many of you know that stewards end up having more going through them than owners. If a guy is a bank teller, there's a certain amount of cash that's his, but there's way, way more that goes through his hands as he counts it. Does that make sense? And so when you talk about stewardship, your capacity increases. That I'm a steward of all of this stuff. Let's, let's continue. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Now today, if someone says to you, oh, God's grace is so powerful in our church, what comes to mind? Let's be honest. Don't read ahead. If someone comes to you and says, God's grace is so abundant in our church, what comes to mind? It's not a rhetorical question. Participation. Hey? Allowances, forgiveness, right? Let's just read on. Let's follow the logic of Luke who's writing this. Okay? Not Luke Morgan, but this the Luke who's writing this. Okay? Let's follow his logic. And God's grace was so powerful at work in them all. Hmm. Verse 34. That there was no needy person among them. So when God's grace is abundant, there's no lack. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. You know what's so interesting is in this day and age, we limit our giving. We've been brought up in churches where you just give God your change. You know, it's kind of like, oh, how many, what coins have I got? Uh, uh, and then you go and you check out and you look at the smallest one. And then that's the one you put in. That's the mindset we have. Part of it was because some missionaries that came through to Africa, a lot of them were really brilliant. But some of them had this, it's called benevolent authoritarianism. It's where you come in and there's this mindset of, oh, you poor people. Can't expect you to give that much. Yeah, if you've just got a little coin, maybe just do that. And so we've got a lot of people today living in poverty because they haven't learned the principle of giving. Does that make sense? All right. And so we see in the New Testament, grace was abundant. These guys were selling houses and the proceeds going into the kingdom. Amen. Let's, let's continue. Uh, by the way, this includes the apostles themselves. Let me just say that. Whenever I talk about giving in this church, it includes, you know, it's not like, you, I don't expect people in this church to do stuff I'm not willing to do myself. Amen? Okay. But I'm teaching you how to unlock doors based on what I've learned for my own life and from the word. You, are we all on the same page there, hey? Okay. So, we see from this scripture that the fruit of God's grace is abundance. There was abundance in love, abundance in forgiveness, but there's also abundance in provision. You know what will start happening if you look at this scripture? Some of you are starting businesses. Those businesses are going to explode and expand so that there'll be no one unemployed in this church. Because you'll find that you've got good people who've been well discipled, who you can trust, who you'll want to hire. I'm not saying you have to hire people from the church. Okay, you don't want to force some people on you. Right? But the point I'm making is there'll be no one who's unemployed in the church. There'll be no one saying, oh, I'm looking for a job. We'll be like, people will be coming. It happens in certain cases where I've had businesses coming saying we need people from your church please do you have anyone from your church who I can trust who I can work with because they want to work with Christians who have integrity that's what will be happening that's exactly what the Bible is talking about here no one was in lack why because of their abundance amen 
Deuteronomy 8 verse 18 in the NIV it says but remember the Lord your God why for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth so when you look at biblical prosperity it's about the ability to produce you can knock me down today clients of mine can say Paul we don't want to do business with you anymore but guess what my wealth is not based on something in a bank account my wealth is not based on a contract that I have with an organization God has given me the ability to produce wealth amen it's an anointing and he's given that to us as Christians some of you are tapping into it some of you are not some of you are sitting on gold mines right now because of what Jesus has placed in you he's given you the power to produce wealth can I hear an amen the power of saying amen is you saying I take that for myself so be it and you're prophesying over yourself if you're saying yeah but how will it work you're cancelling what I'm saying for yourself some people will benefit others will not simple as that okay so we continue and he says and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your ancestors as it is today I want to lay that as a foundation God is a covenantal God God is a covenant God when we talk about the Bible being split into Old Testament New Testament the word testament is basically a covenant an agreement okay and he's saying my giving you the ability to produce wealth is based on a covenant it's based on an agreement that I had with your forefathers God is a covenantal God it's not based on oh does he like me oh is there now a new MD oh is there now and now many of you have been so focused on oh they're changing the MD so it might not work out anymore instead of focusing on the covenant that you have with God are we going we're going somewhere right step by step okay now it's interesting when you look at it in the NLT I like the NLT my wife introduced me to the NLT New Living Translation very nice remember the Lord your God he is the one who gives you what power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath now God doesn't back up on his word amen here's the principle producing wealth requires power just look at it. he gives you the power to produce wealth producing wealth requires producing wealth requires okay if I have to lift up one of you right there is the force of gravity working against me so what do I need in order to lift you up I need I need power in other words the need for power implies there's some form of resistance remember we're talking about the technology of what opening doors you see if that wealth was sitting there on a silver platter for you you don't need power to get it amen but he says I give you the power the anointing the ability to produce wealth because there's something resisting you getting it now there are those Christians who don't have that understanding and what they do is they think life will just happen to them case sarasara whatever will be will be but there are others of us that have learned these principles and so we know that there are doors I have to open there's an anointing that I need there are angels that need Need to be released there's there's certain prayers that need to be prayed in order to get what's rightfully mine because there's something holding it back can I continue there's a system that is holding it back now I want to show you something very powerful if you look in scripture you will know that Adam disobeyed God right but Adam had been given authority over the earth God it says be fruitful multiply subdue the earth have dominion you saw that word rulership dominion right so God says that to Adam Adam disobeys God and what happened 
Satan, who had certain angelic powers, when he then managed to trick Adam, there was an exchange, wasn't there? Right? And Satan was then given the power or the authority in the earth by Adam. So he now had Adamic power in the earth. Does that make sense? And that's why the Bible talk about the God of this world, speaking of Satan, has blinded the minds of non-believers. Right? So what ends up happening is the devil comes through and the way the devil operates, if you study demonology, the study of demons, Satan is not omnipresent. God is omnipresent, right? Satan is not omnipresent. So Satan can't be everywhere at the same time. So he has his fallen angels. He has these demons that begin to operate in different territories, in different spheres. But we know that in order to operate and do various things in the earth, you have to operate through people. Amen? So anyone who's not in the kingdom of God and under the lordship of Jesus Christ is under that influence. The Bible doesn't speak of three different kingdoms. It doesn't speak of five different kingdoms. It talks about the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness darkness and it's not to say every single person has got this demon dwelling in them permanently all the time because they're not enough demons to go around so what happens is they work in clusters they work in groups they work where they are assigned you guys are going to operate in that industry right and the devil gives them that power you operate in that industry this is how you must trick them you operate there with that leader and counsel that leader whisper to that leader foolish things why because the higher up someone goes the more influence that they have that's why those of you who want promotion in your organizations just remember the bigger the level or the higher the level the bigger the devils that's just one of the enemy strategies generally right he will attack influential people he doesn't have to do a thing where it's like ah let me go around deceiving every single person in ghost christian church what does he do the bible says strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered so why does the enemy talk Get pastors because he knows if he just comes and whispers some funny doctrine to me and I'm like oh that's nice and then you trust me and I do it and it's not according to the word of God guess what you've got 300 people deceived does that make sense okay so the higher you go the bigger the devils so we start finding that the way the enemy organizes himself he'll organize himself to be like you know what this sphere of sports and recreation these are the lies we're going to place in people's minds this is how we're going to operate right in this region amongst these people from Limpopo these are some of their weaknesses let's take advantage of those weaknesses let's come and let's strengthen and let's empower this particular ruler there this particular politician there so that the devil's kingdom is advanced amen now the Bible tells us that the kingdoms of this world have become the the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever so God's agenda is for kingdom takeover God's agenda is for us to now go into those places and take over does that make sense but the way we do it is recognizing that there's spiritual power that is resisting the takeover that's why some of you you go and you apply for certain things you might apply for a business somewhere you might find you're in a particular region and things work out really well when you try to do that same thing in another region you have problems it never works out why maybe because the door in the one region is opened for you but the spiritual door in the other hasn't and you have to figure out how to get through does that make sense I wanted to lay that as a foundation now the devil uses different principalities to hold back certain things one of those principalities he uses is Mammon. And Mammon is the demonic entity that controls materialism and the use of money. One of the manifestations of Mammon is things like greed. It's things like fear of lack. It's where the, the amount of money that you have affects your mood on a daily basis. Amen? The sad news is that there are many Christians that are influenced by that spirit, Mammon. If your bank balance is fat, you are happy. 
If it's low, you're depressed. What's happening there? Your mood is being controlled by mammon. Amen? God is calling us as Christians, if we want to take over, we need to be above mammon. We need to be operating from another kingdom, which is the kingdom of Christ. Amen? And then we go in and we are free to give. We don't have the fear of lack. We're not bound by mammon. Amen? So one of the main keys to overcoming is you have to operate from a different kingdom. Because Jesus came and Jesus bought back that which was rightfully ours and that's what the word redeem means it means to buy back amen so as Christians we don't have to yield and be subjected to the devil's takeover of the earth amen God has called us as Christians to operate at another level now if if I want to start flying and I run and I think oh I'm a fast runner and I go woo let me fly you know I saw one of those jokes you know those comedy things where they do funny things and I saw this person well this dummy of a superman kind of figure being thrown off a roof I don't know if you've seen that one being thrown off a roof and then they show someone and they're like can you see and the guy's like huh and then they have a real person who's wearing a superman suit walking around the corner and he comes like this and the person is like was that a real superman <laughs> okay but the point I'm making is if I try to fly right Right now I won't I'll fall down why there's a force gravity in order for me to combat the force of gravity I have to find a different force that is higher and that is superior at that particular time I have to get onto an Arab into an airplane and the law of lift the law of aerodynamics supersedes the law of gravity and what ends up happening I can fly but I need that other law to be in operation amen if you're a Christian and you're living in the earth but are not of the world we live in the world but we're not of the world in order to overcome and to have breakthrough in your life you have to operate from another kingdom and I'm going to share with you kingdom principles this morning that are different that the world looks at and is like that's foolish that's crazy but they're kingdom principles that open doors for you so that you can overcome the thing that has been controlled by the devil and when you tap into this technology your life literally changes and I'm not just talking about financially I'm talking also about relationally with people amen can we do that okay now Isaiah 45 verses 1 to 3 says this is what the Lord says to his anointed to Cyrus whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor that's talking about dominion isn't it so God talks about dominion in the book of Genesis but now he continues talking about dominion here and he's talking about Cyrus and he talks about subduing nations right Everyone following? Right. To open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. In order for us to take dominion in the nations, there are doors that need to be opened. Yes. Amen? And I announce to you right now that God is opening doors before you. Amen. The key is, are you seeing it? Now let's continue. To open doors before him so that gates will not be shut those are two different words when you study in the original those are two different words the word to open doors it's talking about hinged doors that are opened but when those doors are being opened so that gates will not be shut gates in scripture are places of legislation cities were protected by the gates at the city gates legislation would be made the important people of the city would have very various discussions at the city gates and what's happening right now in your life is that there's certain gates 
that God does not want to remain shut. Places of authority where God says you can now enter that place. You can now sit with those people. But how many of you know that through the gates there's still doors for things that are blessings to you and to the kingdom that need to be opened up. Does that make sense? You see you can go to parliament or you can go to state house. There's a gate you first go through. But within those gates there are doors. Have you ever been to a friend's house where you go and it's easy to get through the gate. They don't have these modern gates anymore. You open the gate. Oh, gate isn't locked. You pitch up. You knock at the front door, but the door is locked. Have you experienced the benefits of meeting your friend? No, you haven't. So we see in scripture their gates and their doors. Everyone following? Okay. And God will say, I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. Isn't it interesting? It doesn't just say, oh cool, here it is on a silver platter. There's warfare involved. Things have to be broken down. And if you don't know how to break down those things, you remain where you are just wondering, how come I'm not having my breakthrough? How come I'm not having my breakthrough? Pastor, can you pray for me? How come I'm not having my breakthrough? I'm going to give you the keys today. Amen? Alright. Now, now this is very powerful. Verse 3 he says, I will give you hidden treasures. Please note, he doesn't say, I'll just give you treasures. I will give you hidden treasures. If something is hidden right now, it means it's something you've never seen before. God is saying, I'll give you the stuff, but the stuff is hidden. You hear those stories of people who say, oh, uh, we discovered, you know, there was a widow who was staying, staying at such and such a place and she discovered there was a gold mine underneath her back garden. You know, you've heard those stories before. I will give you hidden treasures. How many of you know that right now, some of you, there's stuff that is your portion, but you can't see it because you're still blinded because your breakthrough hasn't yet come. Does that make sense? Some of you, your treasures are hidden within a person that's your roommate right now. Right now. Some of you, those treasures are hidden and you can't see them, but then someone who you're in band with right now. There's someone who you're here in this church with right now, but it's hidden. Your eyes are closed to it. Amen? Now watch this. Watch this. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored where? Now, you, if, if I go to your house, there's the place where I can go. That's not secret. Where we can watch TV, where we can eat. But there are other places that are secret where I don't go. Amen? So a secret place is not visible to the natural eye. Right? Now watch this. So that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. Everything is about his kingdom. Everything is about his glory. Now, question, do you want this type of wealth? Do you want this type of abundance? Do you want this type of influence? If you don't want it, then this message isn't for you. Simple as that. I'm wanting to provoke you to want it. Especially being a kingdom person. Okay? Now, here's an interesting thing. That word open means to break forth, to let be loose. So there's certain things that are tied up right now, right? That, that, that thing of a door, it also can speak of the lid of a chest that he opens up. A chest full of treasures that he opens up. That thing of darkness in the original language speaks of secret and it speaks of obscure. Things that people have written off and you can't even see it, but you'll see the treasures in it. Amen? Okay, now here's the here's principle. The greater the treasure, the greater the security required. If I come to your house, you might have a little alarm that someone can still fiddle with and get through. Amen? You might have, you know, a few burglar bars, but people can still go through them. If I try to go to the White House, can I hear an amen? Amen. If I try to go to the White House, how easy is it for me to just go in and end up in, in, in Obama's bedroom? Hey, 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 Barack, what's up, man? Oh, sorry, guys, I've just caught you up. How easy can I do that? You know, I heard recently there was some kind of shutdown or something because there's a, there was a, an unauthorized vehicle that managed to sort of pass beyond a particular point and so on. Now, how valuable, in terms of perceived value, 
is the president of the United States. So the protection is massive. I remember when they came for the funeral, for Madiba's funeral, I remember I was on the highway and I was suddenly seeing these black vehicles coming past. And we were told, I'd never seen our, our traffic cops so organized. <laughs> I was driving from here, honestly, I was driving from here through to Joburg. And we all had to just go to one side, all the traffic. And we're cruising, they're cruising there. And I'm like, what's happening? I didn't put two and two together. And I'm like, what's happening? Then I start seeing these black armored vehicles. I'd never seen vehicles like, they're not local ones. Right? And I'm seeing them going zoom, 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 zoom. Organized. Why? The greater the treasure, the greater the value of the stuff, the greater the security. Now, if God wants to give you stuff that is valuable, are you seeing where I'm going? Guess what? You're going to need that code. You're going to need the combination. Have you watched in those movies where it's like, okay, let's see if we can hack this. Okay, let's see if we can hack through this. And there's only some guy with glasses on. And there's a guy with a gun. You can do it. Come on, you can do it. Okay, let's see if we can hack this. Bing! All right? And then there are all these vaults that you go through. All these vaults that you go through. Why? The greater the treasure, the greater the security. Yes. Now, I don't know about you, but in the spirit, because everything starts in the spirit realm. In the spirit, I want to know the technology of opening doors that have been locked. Of opening doors that have got combinations. In my life over the last number of years, I've learned some of it. But I know I need to learn more to go to my next level. Otherwise, what happens, and this happens in business, and I deal with lots of business people. This happens in business. People stagnate. And they reach a certain level. Because that's the, you, the combination you know. You only know the security level for that. Amen? You've only got, you've got level 2 access. Those of you who used to watch 24. Level 2 access. So what's behind that door is limited. Amen? I don't know about you, but I want level 6. I want level 7. How many of you are there levels in the spirit? I want that for what God has called me to do. Now, can we, can we, can we continue? Yes. So the interesting thing that I see here in this passage is that the things God has in store for you are often, number one, behind bars. Bars that have to be broken. Number two, they're often hidden. So they need to be revealed. They need to be exposed. Number three, they're often in the hands of kings that have to be loosed. So the Bible says here, subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor. Are you seeing where I'm going? Are you seeing how the Bible talks about it in the New Testament and says, you have to first deal with a strong man. I'm speaking spiritually now. Some of you understand what I'm saying. Some of you are like, okay, strong guys, the guys who do weights. Okay. I'm talking about demonic principalities. I'm talking about demonic principalities. When you have someone who's in business and says, you know what, it's amazing, yeah, I got this deal from these Jewish guys. You know that it's not easy to just suddenly start doing a whole lot of business with Jewish people because often they keep it within themselves. How many of you know that there's certain things that have to be loosed? And then when you go there and you experience favor, it's a whole nother world. Amen. Amen. I remember a particular lady, she was into uh, mining and brick making and that kind of thing. She says, Paul, everything I do in the West seems to work. West of Gauteng, that whole uh, clerk's dorp, potcher's room, that area. Whenever I just do it, it just turns to gold. But it seems to only happen when I do it there. There are principalities. It's not just a sociological phenomenon. There are principalities. Ask yourself, the favor you've experienced, can you see a pattern? And when you want to break into other areas and have doors opened into other regions, you'll do the keys, you'll practice the keys I'm going to give you just now. Amen? How many of you know that there's a term called metron in scripture where Paul the apostle says we will not operate outside our apostolic jurisdiction. Remember he says that. Apostles have authority, spiritual authority in certain regions that God has given them. Right? So you go and God says I've given you this nation or you'll say I've given you this city and you experience an abundance 
conditions of favor when you operate within that sphere. When you move outside of that sphere, it's like, how come it's not working out? And many people wonder, how come when I start these types of businesses with these type of people in this particular area, it explodes? But when I move outside the sphere that God has called me to, it doesn't work out until I apply the technology, if it's God's will for me to be in that other region. Does that make sense? That's why when business people go into different regions, etc., if I know I've got apostolic authority in that particular region, I say, let's pray for you. I say, do it in partnership with the church. Let's plant a church there. Let's go and do marketplace stuff for business people there. Why? Because I know I've got authority in that area. Amen? Okay. Are we getting something this morning? So we realize that um, the greater the treasure, the greater the security requires. In the hands of kings that have to be loosed is this particular treasure. Very often it's hidden. Very often it's behind bars. Which means in order to get access to it, number one, you need kingdom authority. You need kingdom authority. Number two, you need kingdom keys. Amen? Especially because some of it is locked. You need kingdom keys. Number three, there's a degree of warfare. If you look at the language that is used here, there was a degree of warfare. Amen? And number four, it requires the opening of doors. Say to the person next to you, doors are being opened before you. Prophesy to someone else and say, doors are being opened before you. Okay. Now, very often these doors are behind certain gates. They're behind certain gates. I'm going to give you some keys right now. Some keys. And I'm going to give you eight keys. See, the kingdom of God has certain ways of doing things that are foolishness to the world system. Amen? And I've highlighted eight kingdom keys. There are many more, but I want to give you eight. The first is the principle of seed time and harvest. That's a kingdom principle. Very often when you read about the kingdom of God in scripture, there's something to do with seed time and harvest. So, for example, if you want to have friends, you need to sow friendliness. Amen? And have you noticed that it's not just... See, some people say, oh no, but that's so legalistic. That's the law now, Paul. Let me tell you something. If you give me seed and I sow it, do I expect seed to come out of the ground? What do I expect? A harvest. What's better? What's really cool? I'm blown away by the harvest. So that's God's grace and operation. He's saying, just sow this seed and look what comes. Amen? That's God's grace in abundance. So sow friendliness if you want friends. Sow friendliness if you want friends. Now make sure also that you're not just good at sowing. Because it's not just the principle of sowing. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. It's the principle of seed time and harvest. How many of you are farmers here or how many of you grew up in an agrarian society? I like the way the manunis are very quick to do it, right? Many of us, many, many of us grew up in environments where we learned a bit about sowing. Now, some people are very good at sowing, but doesn't mean that they're good at reaping. Please stay with me on this one. You know, sometimes certain things, like how many of you have ever tried to reap carrots? Let's say you sowed carrots and you try and reap them. How many of you have had that experience where you then try and pull it out and only the top bit comes out? Does that make sense? So there's a technology to harvesting. Some of you have sowed much in your lives, but guess what? The harvest is around you, but you don't know how to reap it. You are praying, saying, Lord, I want my harvest. Lord, I want my... He's saying, it's right around you, but you don't know the technology of harvesting it. So before you pray, Lord, please, can I have more this, rather pray, Lord, open my eyes because maybe the harvest is plentiful. Maybe the harvest is right here around me. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, number two, the principle of the word. When you look at scripture, you'll notice that God created the world with 
with words. He created the world with words. And it's important because we are created in His image, so we also create things with, with words. We create stuff with words. Back in 2004, I wrote down some affirmations for my life. I'm not going to go in detail in them, but I wrote down various things. Now that was, what, 10 years ago. And these are things that I love to declare. I I would say things like, I love people and they love being around me, leaving more Christ-like than when they came. Right? I always influence the people around me to think kingdom and they love being around me. As an apostle, I'm devoted to studying the word and to pray. Right? Because I value and honor my wife highly, I always speak tenderly to her. Sometimes I have to work on this one. There's another one I have to work on that I'm not going to say. It's something to do, it's something to do with fitness. Okay. <laughs> God is great in me and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and therefore always walk in peace, boldness and relaxedness in all my relationships. Christ lives in me and I enjoy reflecting him in all I say and do to give others a picture of his heart. I'm consistently, intentionally learning new concepts and thoughts which educates and inspires and shapes others as I pass on what I know. I wrote this 10 years ago. Okay. Um, I've enjoyed. No, some of them are personal. Some of them are personal. I've enjoyed seeing. I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed seeing lasting cultural transformation come to my world through the best-selling. I hadn't written a book yet. Eh? Through the best-selling world-class material I've developed. 2004. I was saying that. Based on Luke 2:52, I'm growing in wisdom and favor with God and man. I'm a pastor who influences greatly beyond the church building walls and I'm graced to do it. I net at least <clears throat> per month, which is, which is normal for me. Okay? That's what I'm saying. Because sometimes when you have a breakthrough financially, you then think it's a fluke. I'm going to have a whole session where I'll teach you how to do affirmations. But you're speaking to yourself. Amen? That's how you create realities. Look at this. God owns everything I have, so I've enjoyed as a steward giving it away and seeing more return. So I live to give. Now those of you who are stingy, if you are saying that to yourself on a daily basis, guess what? Very quickly afterwards, I live to give. I, live, I must forgive. I must... Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into all of these things. My family and friends are significantly benefiting from the money I've earned through faithfully using my gifts. This gives me fulfillment. Okay? Um... Yeah, I've got about 26 of them. Affirmations. You must have affirmations, things that you declare based on the word of God, based on his promise, and that becomes your reality. So that's the principle of the word. The word of God is seed. And when the word of God takes root in your heart, it comes in seed form, but you have to water it so that it grows, so that you become the word. That's why the Bible says we are living epistles. Amen? That's a, a, a epistle is a letter. Okay, we're living letters. People can read the word on us. So learn to declare and prophesy. Right? What comes first? Do you have to believe it in your heart first? No. No. The Bible says, my tongue is the hand of a ready writer. Right? The finger of a ready writer. Pen of a ready writer. So how do you write stuff? With your tongue, with your mouth. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You can start writing realities with your tongue. It's a kingdom principle. Some of you, you pray prayers, then you cancel the prayers that you've prayed because of the confession of your mouth. I'm not saying you must be, uh, you know, you, you have these Christians who give Christian bumper sticker answers to everything. You know what I'm talking about? They're not real. Say, how are you doing? Blessed and highly favored, my brother. But you know the guy is going through stuff. Now, rather say what you're going through, if, if you're in close relationship with a person, say what you're going through and then let God have the final word. But I would hate it if my wife is going through stuff and she's just like, blessed and highly favored. <laughs> blessed and highly favored, my brother. My love, do you love me? Have you got good feelings towards me? You're the husband I chose. You're the husband I love. Uh, you know, I want to know what's going on deep inside. Hey, my love, do you think I'm looking good today? By faith, my brother, by faith you are. <laughs> when I look at you, I just see fine looking black brother. That's what I see. 
<laughs> Name it, claim it, frame it. <laughs> it's my confession. I'll always be attracted to my husband. No, the point I'm trying to make is, <laughs> let's be real. Amen? Let's be real. My love, that hairstyle you've got today, oh, not too great. Yeah? If your wife says, do you like this outfit? Honey, uh, why don't you try something else? <laughs> Anyway, the point I'm making is the principle of the word. We declare things, we create realities. Amen. You write things with your tongue. Three, and then you begin to believe what you're saying. Three, the principle of stewardship. The principle of stewardship. We've spoken about that a lot. It's a biblical principle. God owns everything that you have. Four, the principle of first things. That's a powerful kingdom principle. God wants to know, do you prioritize his kingdom? Jesus was first born from the dead. Throughout the Bible, we see this principle of first things. Give your first 10% to the Lord. That's the tithe. Right? Principle of first things. God is very interested in his glory. God is building his church. Whatever you do, link it with what he's building. Seek first his kingdom. Five, the principle of internal to external. God's kingdom always works from the inside out. Amen. God is interested in your heart condition. He's interested in the motives behind your actions. Very interested. And you must be interested in that too. Six, the principle of favor. How many of you know favor is a currency? Keep praying for favor. Keep praying for favor. What happens is when you have favor, the people's perception of your value goes up. Do you know those people who will pay 100,000 US dollars to have some Elvis Presley uh, shirt or something, right? You know those fans who are crazy about a particular footballer and they'll buy his branded thing, Rooney number 10, you know, and they'll, and they'll buy it. But it costs a lot, doesn't it? That's perceived value. Are you seeing where I'm going? Bill Gates has the same one hour that you have. But his rates, what he'll charge for that one hour, will be significantly higher than what you would charge. Why? It's all about perceived value. Money is to do with value. Amen? Pray that your perceived value goes up. Pray that people will say, Paul, can you just come for a moment and this is what we'll pay you. Why? They perceive that having you is extremely valuable. How many of you know that if you enter certain government buildings, you have to have certain things, don't you? Like certain stamps on your car, certain security card that says, oh, you're allowed to enter. But how many of you know that you can stand outside a government building and you see some people who don't have those cards going in and they'll go through straight to speak to the government official and if you speak to the security guards and say how come you let that person in guess what they'll say I can't stop them they're valued by the other person perceived value amen perceived value results in opening off Pray that your value increases in the sight of people. Okay? Seven, the principle of generosity. You see that in scripture. Live a generous lifestyle. And eight, the principle of diligence. I want to show you how the principle of diligence works. Deuteronomy 15 verse 10 to 11. Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. It's talking about the poor. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your... In all your... And in everything you put your hand to. He'll bless you in all your work. He'll bless you in everything you put your hand to. So put your hand to something. And there's a lot of stuff you can put your hand to while you're raising kids. You don't have to work an 8 to 5 job. Come up with ideas. Come up with inventions. And as you step out, God blesses that which you're touching. But if you're not touching anything and you're passive... He hasn't got anything to work with. Amen? Okay? So just, just watch that. That's the principle of diligence. God blesses your hands. 